I've been part of the RED Volution uh, for uh, quite a long time. In fact, my first two RED cameras were before they had numbers. It was uh, Whiskey and Pandora. I think what it does is it takes the handcuffs off. So this is the story of two parking valets who come up with this very uh, believable scheme that, uh, that while customers at the restaurant they work at are in having their meal, they don't park their cars but instead drive their cars home and rob their houses. Specifically for this, we wanted to get into a darker feel and a, a more of a moody look and a, a, we were really stretching sort of the, the capabilities and, and when we first started testing the Helium uh, camera over at the, at the studios, we were just blown away. We were turning the camera on and things were lighting up that we couldn't see to our naked eye. Right. Whoa, 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 hang back. It's my turn. Welcome to Nino's, sir. That's paddle shift, so don't go breaking the ears off thinking it's your granny's box hall. Having shot there for many years, we were really comfortable with dealing with the rain. We knew how to do it. Uh, we knew how hard it rains there, and you know, we, we prepared. What we were completely unprepared for was the snow. Uh, we were hit with five different snowstorms. Now, saying there's five snowstorms in Portland is like saying there's five snowstorms in Burbank. It's possible. <laughs> it's just you don't think it's going to happen. Do you remember in the old days when they said the red camera didn't work in the cold? <laughs> Not the old days anymore. <laughs> I think had our script said, they arrive at the cabin and there's snow, my producers would have said, we can't afford that. <laughs> so uh, uh, while, it was, while it was rough on production, it, it was an enormous gift to the film. Well, when we first had, uh, you know, uh, the script, we knew that some of the locations uh, we were going to be able to um, find locally. Um, we knew that there might be the chance we might have to build some of them. Well, we had found a cabin that we really loved to shoot up uh, in, in, in Sandy, in Sandy, Oregon, um, amongst these amazing trees. Uh, but we had to decide, do we shoot the interior of that cabin there or do we build one on stage? And at our budget, we were very reluctant to build a set. But at the end of the day, we thought we'd have more flexibility, we could shoot something that looked a lot better. And so we went and we built the set. Well, as it turned out, it saved our life because once it snowed, we needed somewhere we could go and shoot and it became a fantastic cover set for us. Well, I gotta tell you, I don't think I could have done the movie without, without the Weapon Helium camera. It was time, like I've been using RED now for I think since Red actually started up, like uh, I think I was one of the first DPs to to use the Red camera, and uh, this here we go, probably 12 years later now, and uh, I'm shooting with this Helium camera, which I was amazed with. I was able to probably get an extra 45 minutes of daylight per day, so uh, which is amazing, you know. In a low-budget movie, that really helps, you know. I don't have to worry about the limitations of the technology. I can shoot what I want to shoot, knowing that I got it on film. Um, the RED cameras for quite a long time have been able to shoot in low light, but the farther you pushed the ASA rating, the more grain you would get and the milkier the blacks would get, which was to be expected. Now, we found ourselves pushing farther than we've ever pushed before with no grain, with no noise, and the blacks staying solid. And this was quite a surprise, well, especially to my DP, who's always been reluctant to do that, and he did stuff that he'd never done before. Uh, the other problem that we had that it solved was that we were shooting in winter and the days were very, very short. So we would run out of time. So there's a sequence in the movie, a fight sequence that takes place in the snow and the sun started to go down and we weren't finished. And we started pushing that ASA rating. Well, it was past sunset and the footage looked like noon. And it was stunning to us. We were literally sitting at the monitors going, that camera is seeing more light than my naked eye can see. Um, we do all of our own post-production. We do our own sound. We do our own DIs all in-house. So, um, you know, we've developed that over several years. When I started in the business, we were accustomed to cutting on temp prints. And these looked horrible. But you just grew accustomed to it. And you worked with that and worked with that. And then finally at the end, you saw something beautiful. And you're like, oh, great, looks great. 
Well, the problem with shooting with cameras that are this gorgeous is that you're seeing something so beautiful on the monitor, if you see anything less than that, you start to get really frustrated. <laughs> so I find that I'm color timing before I'm editing, which is something I, I, I couldn't even imagine doing before. And it's been great. So literally every rough cut, every temp mix, I'm looking at really beautiful images that, that look the same as they're going to look at the end of the process. So there's no surprises. You know, it, earlier in my career, th I can't tell you how many times I'd be in the final mix going, oh, if I knew the shot was going to look like that, I might have stayed on it longer. Or if I knew it was going to look like that, I might have cut out of it quicker. Now you get a much better sense of what your final is going to look like much, much earlier in the process. This isn't a studio film. It doesn't have a giant machine behind it. It has the people in this building who put their blood, sweat, and tears into building this company and to making this picture. It's, um, it's like rooting for your family to succeed.